Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's educational series. I'm here with a machine learning heavyweight, Professor Michael Lippmann of Duke and at t Labs, chair at Rutgers. He's at Brown now. And I actually have, have read so many of his papers over the years and learned so much from him. It's really just an honor to have him on today. Professor, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. The pleasure is ours. So let's jump into reinforcement learning, which is something you have a great passion for. And I saw that you wrote this fantastic paper using Markov to expand the number of agents for an environment. Do you want to talk about that paper and your work with that? Love to learn about it. Yeah, yeah. So this was back in the 90s, and people were just really starting to play around with different kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms. Reinforcement learning is the problem of learning from delayed rewards, from evaluations as to how to behave better in an environment. And it's it's often considered one of the three main branches of machine learning. The other two being supervised learning, where the learner is told exactly what its output it should produce given different inputs, and unsupervised learning, where it's really given no information at all about what kind of outputs to produce. Reinforcement learning is kind of in between. And the idea is that given the inputs that the that the program or the learner gets it needs to produce outputs and it does not told which outputs to produce but every output that it produces it gets a score and so i like to think about reinforcement learning as being kind of the well kind of the most natural problem it's it's, it's much more like what we actually experience as as people is we're never really told exactly what to do but we're told when we did something wrong and so learning from evaluations is kind of the essence of, of reinforcement learning. And, and the, uh, the late 80s, early 90s were really the beginning of computational reinforcement learning, the, the study of how to get machines to learn from this kind of evaluative feedback from kind of you know, thumbs up and thumbs down feedback. And I was really interested in what would happen to a reinforcement learner that is surrounded by other reinforcement learners. So initially it was very much a you know, one learner in an environment and now the question was, well, what if what if the learning is happening in the context of other individuals that can change their behavior depending on what they they experience? And so I I tried to invent a uh, a kind of a model to capture that idea, but it turns out the model was already invented and it was very old. It was from the 1940s. Uh, there was a model known as originally uh, stochastic games, where the idea is that there's a bunch of individuals, they all have their own utility, kind of their own judgments about what's good and what's bad for them, but they share an environment. And so the actions of some individuals can actually impact what happens to other individuals. So this is very much like what it's like, again, to be a person in the world is, is, is I'm, not, I'm not alone. There's, there's other individuals and they're also trying to learn and improve their utility. But that also explains how a minority can take control of an entire environment without over 50%. How so? You know, if you have a, a group, uh, you know, you, you, you did a great video recently of the papers that are being uh, submitted to conferences, and you talked about collusion within those papers. And you showed that if you have enough people to collude, it can literally overtake uh, the conference, and that there's actually there's no integrity left whatsoever to the, uh, you know, to the paper grading. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So I think what, what you're getting at is this idea that the, the fact that we share an environment, that individual decision makers share an environment leads to, can lead to some very complicated consequences. Nobody's in charge. And so to get what you want, sometimes you have to give other people what they want. And, and there's, there's this you know, synergy potentially that happens between them. So that first paper that I worked on in, in the 90s on this problem really focused on zero sum games. So the idea that there's two individuals and whatever's good for one is bad for the other. Because in some ways that's kind of the simplest step above uh, single agent decision making, right? Single agent is tr just trying to maximize its utility. Uh, when they're in a, when you're in a zero sum situation, you're still trying to maximize utility, but in the face of someone who's explicitly trying to minimize utility. So it's almost like you're in the worst possible world. Uh, what I got very interested in after that and have done a number of papers on since then is what are known as general sum games. So the idea is that there's maybe more than two decision makers and they have kind of decoupled uh, or relatively decoupled utility functions. So what's good for one might be good for another, but it might be bad for a third. And so they have to kind of negotiate what kind of behavior can I be taking? I want it to be good for me, but I want it to be good enough for you that it doesn't become unstable and, and, and you kind of 
act in an unpredictable and damaging way to everybody else. So now we start to get into not just what it's like to be a person, but what it's like to be a person in the context of a community, a, a group of others. Really wonderful stuff. So, you know, deep learning, do you think deep learning can really capture uh, decision making? Or do you think, I mean, that, that's the issues that I've had with deep learning is that, you know, decision making processes is where it, uh, you know, uh, can fail with an environment. Yeah, so so deep learning, so this, the, the I like to think of deep learning as more uh, technology than a problem per se, right? I so would agree with that, yes, 100%. Okay, and so you can, wire up a deep learner to be doing something that's more like decision making and you can wire up deep learning to be something that's very much not um, is maybe just just mimicking. Um, and so so I don't think of deep learning itself as being good or bad for decision making. I do think that what it what it seems to be providing is very powerful function approximation. So the idea is you you normally we have to write a program that takes takes inputs and produces outputs. And some, some of these mappings from how should that input be transformed into an output, sometimes they're very complicated, complicated enough that no person actually can figure out what that transformation needs to look like. Oh. And what's been pretty remarkable is over the last 10, 15 years, people have really found incredibly powerful ways of getting computers to write those transformations themselves. And that's, to me, that's the essence of deep learning. It's a particular architecture for uh, for doing these kinds of transformations that has been very successful in, in being trained. Yeah, no, it's fantastic for facial recognition, you know, a very you know specific uh, you know, task, but you know how how much can you use that in a versatile fashion? Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think I think if you blindly apply these ideas, the ideas that are so effective in things like facial recognition to something like decision making. So I don't know, playing a game or uh, negotiating a, uh, a traffic intersection in self-driving cars or, you know, uh, making purchases on the market, you know, uh, kind of doing investments and, and so forth. These are all interactive decisions that are being made where the information that's coming in is being processed by the decision maker. And those decisions then kind of change the environment in some way. And what deep learning is best at is kind of imitation. So if you know exactly how you want it to behave in all circumstances, you can train it to do that. But then if it encounters a circumstance that's kind of different in some fundamental way from anything it's seen before, all bets are off. It could do something completely unpredictable. And so reinforcement learning thinks a little bit more deeply about, okay, well, what's it, what is it actually trying to do? So if it encounters a scenario that it's never been in before, can it kind of go, go back to first principles and reason, okay, well, what am I trying to do? How how, what will the different things that I might do accomplish and which should I actually choose? Got very well put. Speaking of the markets, uh, my friend, former NYU professor Igor Halpern has been trying to create a reinforcement learner that just has uh, the market as the singular agent. Do you think that's possible to be done? Well, I mean, I think we know that markets are very complicated. And so the idea that you could have one master algorithm that's going to work for all markets, yeah, that's a bit of a stretch. But in any given time, uh, an algorithm like that could learn to make very effective decisions. So, and, and, I, and again, I think- I guess the, yeah, the SPY, the, the SPY being its only uh, agent. The, sorry, I don't- S, the, the SPY ETF. So it only looks at a given part of the market. You know, so it only looks- uh, so it only looks at you know kind of one you know cut off version of the market as its standalone environment. Maybe that might be easier. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. I mean, and it's sort of the right problem formulation for that because what reinforcement learning is trying to do is find ways of maximizing some measure of utility. And what's great in the markets is almost all the decisions you can make have a like a common currency, right? That there's there's you know, dollars associated with it. So you, you, when you make a purchase, it's in terms of dollars. And when you get benefit, it's in terms of dollars. It's oh. harder to apply these ideas, but people are doing it, but it's harder to apply them to, for example, robotics, where, well, moving a limb, like what's exactly the cost of that? And, and you know, being able to successfully pick up an item and put it down, what's, what's exactly the, how, how valuable is that? But Very well um, said, yeah. Yeah. No, totally. I, I mean, you look at the work that, uh, uh, it's Boston Dynamics has done with uh, their robots really very impressive when you consider all the different motions. I mean, I, I have a MIT student I've been working with, and he just focuses on hand movements for deep uh, 
learning neural networks and it's extremely tough, extremely, extremely tough. The thumb, especially. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And I think in fact, Boston dynamics is quite skeptical of machine learning in the systems that they build because they really want to understand how the decisions are being made, how they respond to different circumstances and they want to make sure that they're robust. And that's been a weak spot for a lot of learning methods to date. So where do you see robots in five years? Ah, where do I see robots in five years? So robots are a really interesting case because I think a lot of us are super excited about them. Um, there was this really interesting thing that happened, oh boy, was it 10 years ago now? Maybe a little bit more, where uh, someone within Google started to buy up all of the, the most exciting robotics companies, including Boston Dynamics. So they all got bought by Google and the thought is, okay, this is gonna be it. Finally, robots are gonna be mainstream things. And then very quickly in a year or two, they're like, um, can we get rid of these companies, please? It's very hard to make robotics companies that, that have a positive impact on, on society. Um, they're, they're, so far they've been, you know, a lot of them are just are toys, um, demonstrations yeah. of an idea and not really something practical that people, people need. Um, I, so I, I think it's, it's hard to guess where they're going to be in a few years. I mean, you can think of self-driving cars as being robots, and this is a case where it very, very well could be starting to have an impact. But even that, like uh, five years ago, people were making predictions that, well, five years from now, yeah. self-driving cars are going to be everywhere. And no one's good. Like, we're going to have to fire all the long distance truckers and it's going to completely destroy the economy. Yeah, well, that didn't exactly happen that way. It might in 20 years, 30 years, but it's a much harder problem. Whenever you're dealing with the real physical world, computers are at a disadvantage, right? They don't have all the, the underlying infrastructure that people and animals have for being able to deal with the real world. And uh, the real world is hard. The real world is very hard. And you know, these machine learning strategies represent a lot of different you know, parts of the human body, you know, whereas reinforcement learning, would you say is more of an instinct based and deep learning more of kind of a memory based uh, tool. So you know. they're certainly cognitive, right? They're certainly focused on mental activity and not as much on physical activity, right? So their decision making and recognition sort of ideas. Whereas, yeah, you know, physical motion, um, actually uh, manipulation, grabbing something and moving it around. It's yeah, there's another set of skills associated with that. So you've been around technology. You were part of the first email attachment ever sent. <laughs> Love to hear that story, Professor. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I can't take credit for the, the technical uh, contribution there, but I was in the right place at the right time and it was super fun. So I was uh, out of college. I worked at a company that was called Bellcore, uh, Bell Communications and Research. It was actually the, um, when the Bell system got broken up in the 80s, mm. uh, there had been, you know, Ma Bell, the at and the whole, like all long distance local service, the physical phones, it was all like one giant company. And the government, the US government decided, well, that's a little too much power. Let's break it up into pieces. There's gonna be long distance and that'll be at and There's gonna be a company to make to actual make the physical phones. And then there's going to be a company uh, or a set, set of regional operating companies that would uh, handle local service throughout the country. I mean, for each in each different region of the country. And Bell, Bell Labs, the famous, remarkable research group uh, that had been, been around for, for quite, a, quite some time, responsible for a number of Nobel Prizes, major scientific discoveries, the transistor, like all kinds of remarkable stuff. The question was, well, who do, who do they go with now that we're breaking things up? So Bell Labs went with uh, AT&T and the regional operating companies wanted a research arm too. And so a piece of AT&T or of, of uh, Bell Labs got split off it became originally it was called the Central Services Organization, which is not a very sexy name. And then somebody had the bright idea of, of naming it Belcor, uh, Bell Communications Research. So it was the research arm of the distributed operating companies, the, the Pacific Bell and Bell Atlantic and New York, New England Exchange. So all the different local phone services kind of had shared a research lab. And I was a part of that lab. I was in a group that did, uh, it was called the Cognitive Science Research Group. So it was very much about people and machines being smart and how do we build machines that get that work better with people and solve problems together. So it was a, it was a great place for me to be. I was a junior researcher. Uh, at the time, I thought I would grow up to be a cognitive scientist. And I realized in that group that I was much more a computer scientist. Uh, and so I kind of kept, kept that hat on. But uh, one of the things we had was a 
a, a, a singing group. Uh, we the first the one singing group was called the Telephone Chords, uh -huh. and um, and we sang all kinds of I don't know standard stuff that that people sing. But then we split off. Oh wait, did I did I get this right? Telephone Chords. You know, I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not remembering the names anymore. But we also split off and had a small a cappella group, like a quartet, an a cappella quartet. And I was singing with that group, um, the four of us. And one of the people in the group, Nathaniel Bornstein, was actually on the committee that was creating the new standard for transmitting multimedia through email. So at the time, email was just a text thing. And it was becoming clear that, uh, well, we have a little bit more bandwidth now. We have a lot more interesting stuff we want to be able to send. We want to be able to transmit videos and pictures and even just formatted text was not really an option at the time. And it wouldn't make sense for everybody to come up with their own standard for how to transmit these things because then they'd be completely unrecognizable when, they, when they're delivered to one email address. If you didn't have the right machinery for receiving that, it would just be a big pile of bits. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything. And so it was important that some kind of central organization Comes, came up with a standard and everybody kind of stuck to that standard. So there'd be the ability to, to actually interchange messages. And so he was, he was an important member of that committee and they wanted an example of, okay, the, the standard's ready. We've implemented some software that can actually receive and transmit email that has these, these attachments on them, they were called. And um, now we just need something to send. And so he wrote a, uh, a parody song of a classic barbershop quartet and it was, it's let me call you sweetheart is the song, but he changed it to let me send you email and uh, wrote the words and had us sing them and took a picture of us uh, posing and transmitted all of that uh, in, in an email message, it's a text version, a rich formatted text version, a photograph of us, no video, because that was too much at the time and, uh, and the audio. And so that was the very first email attachment ever sent. Wow, that is super cool. Wow, this has been a phenomenal conversation professor and okay. uh, i really appreciate the time before i let you go i want to know what are you excited about these days yeah yeah so i'm i'm very excited about what these various kinds of machine learning could do for making it easier for all of us to communicate with computers so i think of computers as being something that empowers us that allows us to help get additional work done that that individually is, is maybe too much for any one of us but it's right now very limited so there's not that many people who know how to tell computers how to do complicated things on their behalf you can get software that that you know if, you, if, if what you want to make is you know i want to print a letter on letterhead well you can get some specific software that can do that and can make it print your letterhead your way but if you ever want to do something that's kind of specific to you that other people haven't already worked out uh, then you need to basically be able to program. And I think it's important that we all become programmers. We all can tell machines what we want them to do on our behalf. And I think that's that's a hard thing. I've spent my, my career as a computer science educator trying to help people learn to do that. And I know it's it's not easy. It's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's, there's a lot of mental effort associated with it. But I think the computers can meet us part way. I think it's the case that we can develop software systems that allow us to tell machines what to do that use a combination of kind of traditional programming, but also supervised machine learning, reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning, various kinds of things that we've been studying in the lab that actually are targeted at this notion of how can we make it easier to convey, or at least for experts to convey complicated problems to the computer so the computer can execute them. I just wanna see that basically democratized. I want to see that in widespread use, that, 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 that it's provided in a way that we can all build the kinds of systems that we want. Well, uh, I completely agree with you, Professor. The, I hope that world comes, uh, at least in my, my lifetime, in your lifetime. Well, this was a phenomenal conversation. You're the best, Professor. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for reaching out. It was really great to, chat, to get a chance to chat. Pleasure is all ours.